one. Hi, this is Arkeem Ra, and I'm here with Matt Tracy. Uh, this is our second interview for the Fractal Weapons YouTube channel. And we're, today we're going to be elaborating on the ins and outs of the history of SSP, some of the different ET groups that are involved, and more or less just elaborate uh, on the first interview and get Matt and Matt's perspective on things as well. And uh, if you want to introduce yourself, um, I think that might actually work a little bit better this time. Uh, I really don't know what to say. I'm a, a My Lab survivor, Montauk survivor, all around SSP survivor. I don't really consider myself like other people, uh, those, uh, those hero mongers that consider themselves veterans. I was a slave. I, I didn't have a choice in the matter. I was taken as a kid and uh, tortured, mind fractured, and uh, those fractured components were molded and trained into other personalities that they could use and control all different kinds of areas. I remember service with the uh, Draconian Empire's uh, human auxiliary force. Um, I remember serving uh, several different areas, probably several different altars with the uh, Germans, both in their civilian force um, of, you know, their R&D research and development groups, as well as their military force, Nachtwaffen. Um, I do remember a couple of things about Kruger. Um, I don't really remember um, Monarch Solutions, but uh, I had a weird, uh, encounter when I kind of saw the trailer for a video game that involved time travel and but it was centered all around this company called Monarch Solutions and I and all of a sudden um, as soon as I saw the building name Monarch Solutions I didn't even remember Monarch hadn't heard of it I just started suddenly started freaking out saying, oh my God, they're in a video game. And immediately, uncontrollably, I kind of bi-located or re remote viewed something along those lines, this office room with these kind of human gray hybrid looking guys in suits. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And all of them stop at their keyboards simultaneously and one of them stands up, turns around and looks right at me. And suddenly I'm back in my body, in my bedroom, sitting at my bed where I just was. And then suddenly that one is standing in my bedroom, right in front of me, between me and my window. Just looking at me, observing me, I guess trying to assess if I'm a threat or not after maybe two minutes of him just standing there staring at me, he just kind of disappeared. So I assume I was considered not a threat. Um, so obviously I must have some understanding of Monarch to have had that. Was that, the, was that the thing that triggered you realizing that you were in military abduction black ops? programs oh no this was much later um i was very in denial my most of my life um as i was growing up as a kid as a teenager as a young adult in my my early 20s i was You know, that's just the best way to put it, completely in denial. After this one encounter that happened, while well, I was fully awake, 
um, was the final straw, I guess you could say, that finally pushed me out of my, uh, my box of comfort. And I was forced to realize I was in these programs of stuff that I'd only seen on YouTube and I was remembering things no one had ever talked about. And when I started bringing it up with other people, um, they started confirming that what I was remembering was real because then they started bringing up with me things that night that I was remembering but hadn't said yet and they had never talked about in public. Yeah, I know what that's like. So yeah, so it's just like a further <laughs> compounding of the confirmation. But before that, I had all kinds of things happening as a kid um, around maybe eight or nine years old. I was missing an entire day of the week, the, the same day of the week, every week for several months. Um, Thursday, I'd go to bed on Wednesday night. I'd wake up the next morning. And the first thing I would notice is the homework in my bag was not the homework I brought home last night. So that was, that was weird. I, I go to school and that would be the first thing I would, I would realize is the calendar on the, on the wall was saying Friday. And I, I was like, what? No, it's Thursday. And the date on my homework was also Friday. I suddenly realized, and I'm like, what? And it's as if my homework for Thursday had already been turned in. So I'm like, I started asking around the teacher, my friends, my parents, my siblings, everybody was like, nothing was wrong. I wasn't missing. I wasn't acting oddly on Thursday. But from my perspective, Thursday was completely missing from my memory. Um, I, after this started happening repeatedly, I started freaking out. I'd wake up Friday morning um, crying, freaking out that I missed Thursday again. And my parents just chalked it up as me playing, talked it up as a joke. The same with my teacher, um, the principal. I would even brought it up with the principal and he didn't do anything. He just chalked it up as me crying for attention. It's really hard to understand that this kid's telling and the truth. You see these other kids, you know, they'll say something like that. And suddenly they're brought to, you know, a specialist try to figure out what's going on. Is this really happening? Is something wrong with this kid? But me, for some reason, everybody was chalking it up as a joke or me crying for attention as if nothing was wrong, as if they were programmed to not think of any, think anything of it. And that freaked me out. Um, my dad only maybe 10 years later I'm, at, I'm in my late teens, almost hitting 20, and my dad finally tells me that he finally believes me about what happened, about me missing Thursdays, because I never let up, and I was always freaked out about it. Um, and, you know, he saw that as a sign of that wasn't a cry for attention, something was really wrong. And now it was too late to figure out what was wrong. Right. And uh, I've been asking that question, you know, what could have done that? Obviously, I wasn't. Um, I was there for Thursday, but I was missing my memories of Thursday. And then I so it's almost I like something was happening on Thursday and they're just taking all your memories just to make sure what I was. Sure well, what I uh, figured out, um, and it actually was random accident, I ran across a, 
Um, I forget if it was a blog or if somebody was talking about it on YouTube. I can't remember. But I remember coming across the information that the old MK Ultra, um, the the early stages of the MK Ultra project, when it was still public, they had patented a drug that I can't seem to find. If somebody else could find it, that would be awesome. Um, but they had patented a drug that causes you to lose the memory of the last 24 hours. So if you were, if I was taken Friday morning, you know, before dawn and then brought back and given that drug just before being brought back, the last 24 hours would have been missing. Yeah, that sounds like what it might have been happening to you. So more or less the, from the introduction, I, I, you know, I get that, uh, you were in black ops programs and we, the viewers get the gist of how it started for you. I was uh, all over the place. What's that? I was all over the place. I've got altars in every nook and cranny of the programs. Yeah. Every time somebody starts bringing up something new, I start remembering things. Yeah. Kind of, it's kind of one of those things. Uh, it's yeah, where we it's tend to trigger each other's memory recall. Yeah, and it's it's never like, oh, cool, another altar. Yeah, it's always like, oh, god damn it. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I wanted to dive into some more of the history of the SSP with you, I guess, um, because I do know that you know a bit about it. Um, but one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, and I guess because I have my opinions on it too, is just just a conversation starter. Um, and I wanted to ask Penny this, but uh, I forgot to. So I want to bring it up in this interview. Um, why do you think it is that these Black Ops programs bother to put us back? Why do we even have these normal lives? I've asked that question to myself. I don't have a concrete answer that this is what it is, but I have some theories um one of them is the idea of maintaining public control on earth the only way to do that is to stay as in the shadows as possible and if too many people go missing more and more questions start getting uh asked and uh if enough people start asking the wrong questions, then, or I should say the right questions, then people, you know, start banding together to figure out what's going on. And then suddenly, you know, if enough people start, then the right- Well, that would explain why they take us no. over and over again, this right? Is, okay. This is why they bring you back and memory wipe you and let you live out your life is because they don't want to lose control of the earth populace of the of the uh, of the public's uh, mind control and people can break free from that if they start asking questions if they start getting curious they can't, it, it is possible to break free from it yourself if you if you start asking the right questions to yourself. Um, but the reason I think that I've theorized you're brought back is um, sorry, I lost. <laughs> They bring us back. Yeah, I lose I lose track of my thoughts and the organization of my thoughts very easily. No, I know what that's like. Yeah. Um, I think that part of what's going on with us being here on Earth in these normal lives is this is um, like a really crude way of saying it. Obviously, it's not like literal, but it, 
to me, it's sort of like a save folder. Like Earth and our lives here on Earth, it's like a save folder and our consciousness is a file. And they can access that file whenever they want by letting us live these normal lives. Well, actually, um, that's not what you're what you're trying to say is they can take parts of our consciousness and then go play with them while the rest of it functions here on Earth. No, no, that's not, that's what not I'm really saying. what happened. That's not what I'm saying at all. Okay. I'm just saying that while we're here on Earth living our lives, we can be taken for these programs. And it's sort of like your consciousness well, is like a file in a computer, which is these bodies. And when they want to access that file, they can kidnap you, take your consciousness, put it into a clone, uh, take, you know, obviously it's a fracture. It's not your literal, you literally. It but, is. Um, it's the, it's the entire consciousness brain has to be put into that clone, not just the alter, the fractured alter. It all comes in one go. Um, you don't get broken up. Um, they don't have the technology to do something like that. You had your entire consciousness, your entire soul, your entire energy body gets transferred to another body. There's still a tether to this body through the pineal gland, that, that link that, that w occurred when you incarnated into this body um, is still there. So if that body dies, you get like a rubber band snapped back to this body. Um, but your entire self gets put into that clone body. And then they, they, uh, they call up the, uh, the command codes or whatever they're using as a trigger to control the organization between the altars in your in your mind, between you and all the other altars, to pull push you back into the subconscious and pull forward the altar that they want to work with in that body, in that service. That's how that works. Now, putting us back here in this life, uh, playing devil's advocate for them, it would be more efficient for them to leave us in those stasis that stasis gel, that yellow gel they put us in that holds our bodies, um, it stops our bodies from aging and, and just puts us in a kind of a coma state. It would be more efficient for them to leave us there than to put us back into this life. If all they wanted was for to use us, but they there has to be some other reason motive to put us back to put out the extra effort the extra resources of putting us back into our this life well also you got to keep in mind that there is before time travel happened there is some sort of baseline timeline where it didn't happen and from what i understand at montauk they figured out that certain people hold a certain weight in the timeline and affect the outcome of the timeline. And from what I understand, I'm not stating it as fact, but from what it seems like is if they were to take all the people that they, they put in these programs completely out of the timeline, um, I think it would have unforeseen or could or would have unforeseen consequences that could cause major problems. Um, so I think that could be part of it. It's just timeline continuation. Uh, but I can't be certain on that, but it, it seems like a logical. Um, only as, think of it this way. You've got uh, a person out there that's going through all of this that was slated to be put back after a certain time frame, but they die in such a way that they couldn't not a, no material could be um regenerated let's just say they didn't have any they lost all of the dna let's say the archive of dna to create another clone of this person is in the uh, same lab that 
the originals being stored or let's or let's forget about the cloning process and just say because some of these services use your original body right uh and if your original body dies you die um there's no putting you into a clone body unless they can pull back your soul con your specific consciousness into a container which they have the technology to do that, but they require your original body to do that. Um, let's just say your original body dies in such a way that you are completely disintegrated and you cannot be regenerated and brought back. Well, the slated time that you were supposed to be brought back, you're missing. You just, you, as a kid, you just suddenly are missing that's that's kind of happens in time that happened that happens that has happened that that's part of the time so to say that they do that just to um maintain a certain amount of time has some weight but it's not a concrete amount of weight um because probably they, more than one reason why they put us back it's probably not just one reason i suspect so uh, I suspect it started with some kind of think tank saying uh, these are the variables, these are the, these are the positive outcomes, these are the negative outcomes we're going to be facing if we don't do it this way. Um, and it's all a matter of figuring out what all that is to answer that question. You know, what are all the different variables that would occur if all they did was take us and never bring us back? what are the outcomes that occur in doing so in bringing us, putting us back into this life that would not have occurred otherwise yeah i just think that um with as many people that are in these programs as i mean it seems like it's quite a few people um just the germans alone take 150,000 people a year i guess um so to me it's like if if they weren't putting us back i mean that's like a lot of people you I know do, what i mean I like they, they kind of have to right like i do want to bring up a little statistic and i think this is the st i don't think this 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 uh, statistic for worldwide i think this is just for america since a uh, since the mid 1940s the number of missing persons in america have stayed consistent give or take a few hundred, have stayed consistent at 700,000 people per year. Still to this day, even though the numbers of the population has grown, the numbers of basically every aspect of our population has grown, the number of missing persons every year, give or take only a few hundred, have stayed consistently at 700,000 people per year. That seems a bit odd. That seems very too consistent to be natural. I also gotta, it also does seem to me though, just looking at, you know, the world around you, there obviously are um, kidnappings and disappearances and stuff like that that have nothing to do with these programs. So oh, yeah. it's, it, it, that, that makes it even a bit strange. That's where the variable comes in. Yeah. You know, the, uh, where the difference in each year comes in, give or take a few hundred, sometimes give or take a thousand or so. But if you average them all out, they stay at 700,000 people per year. Yeah. Um, so it makes you wonder if there's just a lot of unlucky people that just don't get put back. Now, now that's oh, you just that's the people that were that was the people that were never brought back, that were never sent back. That's not in that doesn't that number does not include all of us that were sent back. Right. That's just the people that didn't make it. Yeah. Um it's uh 
kind of disheartening to see and realize it's occurring and to know that the average Joe isn't paying attention and doesn't care. And if we told the them what we're going on, is too busy paying attention to whether he can pay his rent this month or not. That's so true. That he has, he's too busy trying to figure out if he can put food on his family's table to feed his family or not. That's a good point. And they, they put us in that state on purpose so that they can control you know, what we're focusing on in life, what we're thinking about, um, so that we're not too busy uh, to make them richer. Yeah. So that we're not too busy with our own desires and, and dreams to put more money and resources into their pockets. Um. One thing I wanted to delve into with you, uh, which is something that I delved into a bit with Penny, is um, <clears throat> the history of these different ET groups that are part of the secret space programs. Like, obviously, the Anunnaki, which you have all these opinions about using that word because it just means messenger, right? Or what angel means messenger, Anunnaki means visitor from the sky, right? Anunnaki is, was used back then by the ancient Sumerians in the exact same way that we use the term ET today, yeah. or extraterrestrial. Every being, every person, even if he's human, um, that was not born <clears throat> on Earth soil is an extraterrestrial, is an ET. And same thing as an Anunnaki. They'd be and Anunnaki. they would call him, the ancient Sumerians would have called each and every one of them an Anunnaki. But now we assert, associate that term with reptilian for some reason. That, uh, I think that was a David Icke thing. <laughs> I think he's the one that started that crap. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so that's one thing that I want to really touch base on too. Like, I guess just in general, this channel is... Uh, you know, we're one of the things that we can always assert to people with with this channel is the fact that it's a collaborative thing, and that we're people that were in these programs that have shared memories, shared testimony, and one of the things that I personally think makes our testimony ring truer than some other very arguably nefarious sources uh, is the fact that we can both vouch for what each other are saying or we all can do that we all have the shared reality that we are a part of it's not like one person spouting off about these ideas and theories that they have um and uh i think that's really important and i think it's important that we bring up like people like david ike and Corey good and uh some of these guys who for some reason people associate us with them while meanwhile, we'll tell you straight up that they're charlatans and they're weasels, you know? I don't um, know. I think, I think Corey Good refers to all of us that have memories of serving in the German fleet. I think he calls us all demons. As if, he, yeah. as if the stuff he did was better in some way. We were all, every single fucking one of us is a slave, right. is still being taken. Until the day we die, we are still considered tools, assets to be used. But uh, everything we've done out there was at someone else's whim. And it was at that person's... Uh, selfish desire they none of it was done for the betterment of all of mankind or all of the galaxy it's Every almost kind of like when you look at earth because some hum, the the people the humans that were that are in control of these programs want something that someone else has 
and uses us as tools to obtain that. We have murdered entire species out there. We've, did, we've blown up entire populated planets and people are um, becoming furious that the galaxy is against us, that, uh, that we should push back at, the, at being pushed back into our, our solar system and uh, like putting being put back into our playpen. I am personally surprised that the rest of the galaxy hasn't just wiped, you know, their problems away permanently by completely making our entire species extinct. I'm surprised that they have had the compassion and mercy to see us as ignorant children and they're treating us as such, as ignorant children who don't know better, not as competent adults who know better and will be treated as adults, as, as murderers and criminals. We're being treated as ignorant little children who simply don't know better. Um, By who, though, really like, okay, I, I think that's an interesting take. There because... is a galactic authority. As... Right, that, oh. that, 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 there's so, this is something that's confusing to me too, which we can elaborate on from the last interview that I did with Penny is there's a galactic authority that oversees everything that seems to be separate from the Draconian Empire. The galactic Where... authority considers everyone sentient. Um, the Galactic Authority is younger than the Draconian Empire, um, but has reached the point um, in power simply because of its numbers of, uh, of uh, peoples that have joined it. Different even the, races. Even the um, Draconian Empire um, listens to what they have to say with seriousness. Um, so what does what the, what does the galactic authority think of the whole situation of us being basically our souls being treated as property and us being used as a resource by ET groups? They, I'm not sure about what all the laws are, but from what I, what little- It to me like they need to change. What, well, these laws are millions of years old. Yeah, that um, might be a bit archaic. You got to think about this. Um, you're you're thinking very narrowly. You're thinking sp only about us, but you're not realizing that we're not the only young, ignorant race of people in the galaxy that have come up there were there were young ignorant races before us that probably acted in the same manner and there will be after us and there are others out there right now so who the the government of the galaxy is acting under experience not under the, this is a one time thing and we've done this more than once in the past, but I think yeah, that but last, I think that the last um, few times that that this occurred, um, when humans were brought back and asked, they were basically giving them ultimatum each time. Um, they the gal the galactic authority recognized that the parents. Our parents are considered as the Jahami. The Jahami are considered our parents. Um, even though we have other species in our genetic mix, the Jahami were the first ones to breed humans. Um, and so we're considered their um, children, not necessarily property. And it's because of that, that we're being given a chance as far as the idea of being property, I think there's kind of a language barrier going on there. It's more children. 
Well, um, my whole thing is, um, I can tell you from memories that I have um, of service and my own lifetimes as a ET. Um, they very much so view <clears throat> us as property. I mean, you can say what you want to. This isn't an interpretation. I remember it. And um, not only that, Marduk, who I found out through Penny, apparently owns the planet Earth. He considered my soul his property. The reason he owns the planet Earth and the reason the Galactic Authority um, recognized that is first off, Earth is a draconian occupied space. The Jahami have a contract with the Draco Empire. The Jahami are members of the Draco Empire, not the Galactic Authority. And the Jahami um, have a contract to lease the planet. They're renting the planet. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Marduk is Inky's son. And we understand Inky is a half-breed himself. He's half draconian, half Shahami. Um, his father is or was the king of all the Shahami and was seen as so unruly and aggressive, even the, even the uh, queen mother of the Draco Empire um, sought to find a way to subdue his aggressiveness. So she actually married off one of her uh, draconian royal daughters to him. And they gave birth to Inky, who is the half brother of Enlil. Enlil being the older of the two. Um, Inky is the one whose genetics actually managed to work in creating humans. The Homo sapien is a mix of 25% draconian, 25% jahami, and 50% local earth primate. Now there's another group called Homo capensis, which was it which is considered the the royal line of the human race, or at least in terminology, basically what they were is the Jahami find Earth to be um, deadly. The nitrogen in their atmosphere break apart um, the telomeres in their DNA. Um, and the, uh, the monoatomic elements that they use to protect their DNA doesn't really help much against the nitrogen atmosphere. And because of that, their lifespan is shortened significantly. Um, so they made homo capensis, which they basically took humans, which were already 25% um, draconian, 25% um, jahami from their inky um, bloodline and 50% local primate, they took humans and then further Inky and made Homo capensis, which we consider to be the red-haired giants. Also note, I found out that Genghis Khan was said to be over seven feet tall. Even though he had an oriental face, he was over seven feet tall and had red hair. Interesting. Yeah. And more than 98% of every Asian person on this earth has a lineage um, that can be traced back to Genghis Khan because of how much sex he had during his day. Like he conquered everything and everywhere and he slept with every single woman he could find. So there's a whole lot of offspring from him. Um, if you have any kind of lineage um, linking to the Orient, it's more than likely you have a, um, a um, lineage linking to Genghis Khan. Anyway, um, where was I? I lost track of my thoughts. We were just talking about Homo capensis. 
the Red Hair Giants. So by Red Hair Giants, uh, explain the how big were they? Uh, where did they live? What happened? Well, to them, they probably started at around 12-ish feet and uh, slowly shrunk over time. Uh, What's probably, going on with all the, uh, like, okay, all the evidence of their existence, like the, the bones and the archaeological evidence, like, What's going on there? Uh, that I, I don't really know too much about that. I know that the original purpose of the Smithsonian, um, the original purpose of the forming of the Smithsonian was to grab bones of giants and get them out of the public eye. And then they would... Uh, uh, hire ships to go over the Marianas Trench and dump the bones into uh, Challenger Deep. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be talking with an archaeologist that uh, is a friend of mine tomorrow because he knows a lot about a lot of stuff I believe in. And I know that he's more or less going to tell me that I'm full of shit, but I just kind of want to hear his take on things. You know what I mean? I want to see yeah. where he's coming from. What he's found as an archaeologist, what they teach him, um, and I even I'm interested in maybe interviewing him. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but um, no, that's something that I'm really interested in, and and I can just tell you, man, I feel the weight of it every day. What's been stolen from us, our own history has been stolen from us. You know, we are living in a lie. I felt it my whole life, and uh, it's unfortunate that so many people that go down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out our history come out of it in very strange places like flat earth and um you know uh just all sorts of places that aren't based really in reality a lot of the times and a lot of it was a psyop to to test the populace and see how much control that they have over manipulating the beliefs and thoughts of the mass public. How, how well are, how efficient are their efforts and techniques and strategies? Yeah. Um, I remember now what I was trying to get at about the whole homo capensis thing. Um, back talk, talking about, um, shit, I'm losing it. Homo capensis, um, red-haired giants. Oh, um, about the whole, the four times before that we were brought back to uh, the solar system. There, this, ha this has happened four times in our past. Cur we are in currently attempt number five of leaving Earth. Um, four times in our, our past, I believe that it was actually Homo capensis that was leading the charge. Um, that was actually gaining the technology, uh, gaining power over um, knowledge and the resources they need to uh, free themselves uh, from the Jahami and started going out into, you know, local space and reaching out throughout this arm of our galaxy and then pushed back. I think this attempt number five is actually the first time Homo sapien has led the charge. Because before we were considered, Homo sapien was considered the slaves of the Homo capensis. Yes. And the Homo capensis were considered the children. We, by the galaxy, as far as the galactic authority goes, we are considered ch the children of the Jahami. The Draconian Empire considers us the property of the Jahami. And the Jahami are property of the Draconian Empire. They are subjects within well, How the does that rule in with Marduk saying he owns the planet if he, is that who they're he's leasing? Paying the le he's paying the lease. That's all that means in legal terms, in legalese. Marduk, we mine all the resources. 
the uh, the bloodline family upon which Marduk is the head um, takes a percentage and then pays rent to the rest of the Jahami, and then the Jahami pay the the actual lease directly from the um, Draconian Empire. They pay on the lease. And what do they have to pay? All kinds of stuff. Uh, it started out with uh, raw minerals. Then as we became agriculturists, that got added into it. As we became animal farmers, that got added into it. Uh, there was a time in our history where the Draconian Empire considered human as a delicacy, also as a good fighting force. So even the Draconian Empire since the beginning have been as part of the rent getting humans as a mix of those who were useful on the battlefield were allowed to live and serve at, as soldiers. Those who weren't were eaten. It, since the Germans left the planet and modern man has changed the view that the draconian empire has on humans as far more useful regardless they can be trained um the germans kind of changed their outlook on our, all of man's usefulness so there was laws put in place to outlaw the use of humans as food but the ICC, oh, AKA the bloodline families are the, in control of the ICC. So anytime you think about the Alliance, which is the new word for the ICC, you're thinking about the homo capensis, the bloodline that are um, the bankers, control of all the money. They are, they're saying fuck it to those laws, whatever they can get their hands on and whatever they can use to obtain it, they will. And if that means selling human body parts and adrenochrome, they're going to do that. And they're gonna find every single way they can to get away with it. This is an under the rug operation. So this is like the royal families and stuff like that, basically, yes. right? Yes. Right. Um, people, a lot of people seem to, when you talk about the bankers and what they're doing, they try to take it to an anti-Semitic place. And I don't think that's really- The modern day bankers started with the Jewish families, the highest um, authority levels of the Jewish families. Those are still bloodline families. They are, they are homo capensis uh, descendants just like the uh, Vikings, just like... Um, um, Where does the Catholic Church fit into all this, then? Right, because it's not just the Jewish... Well, the Jewish I royalty. think... But you gotta look at the beginning where it came from, Rome. Rome, the uh, heads of Rome were bloodline family members. And they saw a new way of controlling people in, in such a way that the people became fanatical and would die for them regardless. By controlling their beliefs, their religious beliefs, they could control their, their every whim. And they saw that in the, uh, the, the local beliefs that were growing at the time. And the word Catholic or Catholicism is literally Roman Greek for the most, um, the most accepted religion by the majority the most majority accepted religion. And they took control of it. The, uh, the heads of the, uh, the Roman empire took control of it and became the priests. 
And by doing where, where so, do the bloodline sit now? Like, okay, because I can only imagine that uh, I know some of us in the programs have bloodline in us. In fact, well, I am told every, that all of us do. Every person that's taken has a bloodline connection. So I want to make something really clear here. I don't have any sort of hatred towards any group that has this blood line in them because I'm taking a gene genealogy test soon to find out if I'm bloodline and I believe I am. And I do not want I already to, know that I am. I do um, not want to ever take this to a place where people can think that a certain group is behind everything and doing it all. It's the royal family families, it's the Illuminati. The families are not all of of one accord. It's and it's not it's not a uh, one base of people doing it behind the scenes, and I don't I don't want it to ever. Genghis Khan was a would a bloodline member. The Yellow Emperor was a bloodline member. The Emperor. So basically, um, no one's no one's immune. The Emperor to this. of Japan. It's all over the world. I'm sure that they're. I can only imagine that African kings might have bloodline in them that's one of the histories that's harder to find anything on uh, same thing with the native americans um I, I i i'm kind of curious about those histories because people always talk about what's happened to the europeans and, and um what, what happened in asia abram who became abraham who became the father of the of the original jews not act not necessarily the jews that call themselves Jews today. But the original Jews, Abram was a bloodline um, offshoot. And when I, you say offshoot, it basically a of a bastard line who was then given power. And he lived during Mard Marduk's reign of um, Samaria. That city that he left um, was Babel. That city that Abram left to become Abraham and the father of the Jews, the city that he left from was Babel, which was ancient Sumeria. Okay. We're talking about roughly six, five, five to 6,000 years ago. And uh, the ancient writings, I don't remember meeting Marduk personally. I know we've talked about your connection with him and, uh, and things he's done to you. I don't remember meeting him. All I have to work off of is, is the history that I've uncovered. And the ancient writings um, of Samaria, Mesopotamia, and uh, Arcadia, these ancient writings depict Marduk as the god king son of Enki. And so if that's the case, um, regardless of if he's the son of Enki, Enki being half Shihami, half Draconian uh, blood descent, that means Marduk is going to have, at minimum, a portion of Jahami and a portion of Draconian in him. Inki himself was seen as, as a Jahami with lizard scales. I, I don't know how to explain this one to you, but the Marduk that I remember, um, I remember him looking like an alligator. Um, and I, my memories are, kind of, it's kind of like the Swiss cheese effect thing where um, there's only certain things that I can see. I can't see the whole picture, but that's, what I, that's the way with everybody that that's remembering these things. It's especially me. Um, but yeah, from what I remember, he was, and Joseph remembers him too. Um, uh, it was a alligator looking dude, went by Marduk. And I'm pretty sure he's the one that Sumerian tablets talk about. And I, he had a time bubble in England that was no different really than the Montauk one, except it was his thing. 
and I worked there as well as at Montauk in the same lifetime. Um, that's, that was my Jacob Alter. Um, uh, and he did stuff to me like, um, he see he felt looked at in some way I betrayed him in the past, is what was was the way that he looked at it, and he was punishing me, and he owned my soul. Basically, and I was a, a mercenary and an assassin for him. And the Jahami are very vengeful, spiteful people. Yeah, well, he was very. Uh, the Jahami are uh, very smiteful, very vengeful people. Yeah, he he did one of the things that he did like was uh, he kept me, and I have a sister named Arcturia. Um, he kept me and her in uh like a cage next to his like throne that he would sit on um and so and like we were parrots like he put us in bird bodies like i don't know if we were parrots like maybe we cause or something but like a tropical kind of like colorful bird and um i would he i would go there and he'd like tell me what to do and send me on missions and stuff and i would be looking at myself as a bird and vice versa my bird me would see me and it was just like this really like humiliating thing. Like he was intentionally humiliating me. Like with everything he did, that he was trying to humiliate me. Some time travel to put you both in the same room at the same time looking at each other. Yeah. Because you can't split each other up like that, like right there and then. Um, you're looking at, you're living the, t your timeline. Limit. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. No, that's what, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, like, so I get I, that. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I don't know, man. It doesn't sit very well with me that he apparently owns the planet. Um, it's... Uh, well, he's no longer has actual, has any actual authority anymore. Um, could you elaborate on that? Uh all he's allowed to do is pay the rent to the Jahami who pays their rent to the uh, Draconians. He's not allowed to actually make any decisions anymore. Okay. It's like the, uh, the royal family in England <clears throat> compared to their prime minister is the one who actually makes the decisions while the royal family is just a figurehead that reaps the rewards. Do you know... Um... Anything about the, the history of the United States uh, before it was the United States and uh, the history that the natives have here that, that before the colonizers came and uh, like also like Africa as well. Like what was the, some of the, cause I know we talk about Egypt all the time, which was in Africa. I'm kind of curious if you know anything else about the history between like the, those places in ancient times? I actually don't have much. I have more understanding of ancient Egypt because of my own personal research into the subject versus right. the rest of Africa um, and um, the Americas. Um, I know that there are ancient stories passed down still to this day um, among the Native American tribes of the red-haired giants, and they called them, you know, they were kings, they were the, the rulers, and during times of scarce um, food, you know, food shortages, they ate a lot more, and they chose to survive over, you know, the survival of their subjects, they ate their subjects. That's where the whole idea of giants eating people comes in, is they were set up as the rulers over the homo sapiens, the miners, the workers, the people who actually um, procured and produced the means to pay the rent on this planet. They were the managers. That's what the ruling, the royal classes is. That's what it boils down to, the managers. They took their resources, 
left them enough to survive, took um, a portion of it for themselves, and then paid off their parents, the uh, Jahami, who were rulers over them, and they pay off the Draconians, who were rulers over them. But anyway, during times of scarcity, when there wasn't enough food to go around, they decided they were going to eat their slave workers because they didn't see them as anything more than tools. And they could just make more. Yep. Sounds about right. That's where that whole giants eating humans comes into play. And amongst the, the few things I'm aware of in the Native American tribes histories is they have a history and their history um, depicts the Bigfoot, you know, the Sasquatch as a completely different species from the giants. All these people that are thinking they're the giants, they're, they're not. They're a completely different species. They have also been known to steal children as food, as a food source, but they're a completely different species to the Homo capensis. Man, it gets pretty bananas, dude, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I suspect I mean, well, that why they would people be talking about offshoot um, um, the, the Sasquatch. I suspect they may have been some sort of offshoot um, experiment along the path of either creating Homo sapien or creating Homo capensis. Yeah, one can't be sure. Um, well, it's I a mean, theory I have. It's nothing concrete. Yeah, uh, but I would I would say that I've been out in the boonies and talked to some people, enough people that, I mean, I just don't see how so many people would say that they see something in it to have it just not be real. And uh, it's kind of wild. People always say, um, I don't know. It's kind one of the things that is disappointing is there isn't very much good video or picture evidence of a lot of these things and but then again like when you like i don't know when you try to in the moment capture like something that's running around or an object in the sky like it's a lot harder than people think it is to get captured that stuff sometimes and not uh, just that it there's also your cameras that you're using have these auto filters and these auto focuses and they lock on to something and they try to focus on it. They try to filter out everything. They're trying to clear it up. And these, uh, the fields that are being generated around the craft to, uh, for propulsion affects the way the light wraps around it and will affect um, how these auto filters and auto focuses are trying to do it. And that's where all these blurry images are coming into play still today even with our more advanced technology if you were to actually if you notice these these older um uh film based cameras had a higher resolution image than the cameras of today even though our cameras of today have are supposed to have a higher resolution and better quality it's all about, it's all a lensing effect because of the fields that they're producing. It's causing the auto filters and auto um, focusing um, apparatus with the digital cameras to basically go haywire um, because it's trying to focus, but the light um, focusing, it keeps changing. That makes sense. Take a, uh, one key point is there was a show, there was an air show, uh, I think this was in New York, um, that had the B-2 bomber, the B-2 spirit bomber in it. And the B-2 spirit bomber, suddenly you're hearing its engines roaring very quietly because it was designed to be quiet, but you can still hear its engines. And suddenly you don't hear its engines anymore and at a very specific angle and distance, it suddenly completely disappears where other aircraft were still completely visible to the naked eye, 
you know, you could even, uh, we're close enough to where you could even make out the uh, identification numbers on the other aircraft, same distance, this thing suddenly disappears. It's, it's a lensing effect. The uh, light wrapping around the field, it suddenly turned on to um, turn off its, its jet engines to completely silence itself. Interesting, physics are crazy. The uh, B-2 bomber has two different forms of propulsion. It has its turbojet engines and then it has a uh, this solid state chemical um, that it will suddenly burn and uh, and drive through a high voltage generator to kick out the back end uh, to replace the high voltage uh, negative charge end of the massive capacitor that is its electrogravitic propulsion system. It's how it's able to leave uh, the atmosphere. The B-2 bomber can orbit Earth for a short duration of time till that fuel runs out. Um, it's meant to be a low Earth orbital uh, craft. Um, in the lower atmospheres of about 50,000 feet on down, it uh, will use its jet engines using normal jet engine fuel. And that fuel is put through a high voltage field of negative, turning that exhaust into high voltage negative ions. The front end of the leading edge of the wing is positively charged with the other end of the capacitor. And this creates a field of more of an egg shape um, leading towards the leading edge of the wing um, as, the, as the smaller end, it creates an asymmetrical high voltage capacitor. And this is how its electrogravitic um, field is generated. And then um, at higher altitudes where the jet engines simply don't have enough oomph to function, it, it's capable of turning those engines off and you, under battery power, I think it is, uh, it will um, turn this solid state fuel block of fuel into, it will evaporate it into a chemical, which it then pushes through the high voltage generators, uh, field generators, which causes them to become negatively ionized high of, you know, the high end of the negative end of the capacitive terminal. And that negative uh, voltage is pushing towards the smaller end of the terminal, which is the leading edge of the wing, which is the other end of the capacitor, and it's pushing the craft forward. So that's and like of doing this in low Earth orbit, outside of the breathable atmosphere for any kind of even a ramjet engine a higher altitude than even a ramjet engine. It, it, it cuts off all air intake at that point. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now myself. Um, Engines are my thing. They're, they're my biggest um, hobby. Um, yeah. Electrogravitic engines. I know more about them than anything else. So do you know about the engines of like the... Uh... Star Destroyer knock Waffen craft and stuff? I've been trying to break those down. The, the big multi-kilometer um, ships, I'm, I don't remember. Um, or if the engine I'm thinking of is a part of that ship, I'm not sure. Because um, I, I don't remember walking around those ships. The... Uh, the teardrop shaped ships have a highly advanced, far more powerful version of uh, the EM drive, the, uh, that copper microwave engine. Um, they were able to take the technology to a far higher level and one uh, evolutionary level of that along that path is what the Navy tried to patent a few years ago, calling it the pious effect. Um, that's one 
of the evolutionary uh, levels along the path of the copper microwave electrogravitic engine. Interesting. Um, so um, we touched on the history of the Shahami quite a bit. I, I, is it Zahami? Am I saying it wrong? J, 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 Okay, well, anyway. Think um, of think of a J and a sh. J. 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 <laughs> anyway, J. we've been talking quite a bit about them. Do you know a bit more of the history of uh, the Draconian Empire itself? I don't quite remember too much about that. I know that the uh the head royal house of the draconian empire there are there are seven races um as uh part of the leading elite of the draconian empire and the six lower elite races of the empire were um taken over by the head the uh, the the white royals, as they're called, um, the alpha draconians are the ones, the white ones with wings. The white ones are known as the alphas. They're you know the head, the alpha draconians. Alpha draconians uh, come. Alpha draconians come from the planet that we refer to as Alpha Draconis. Okay. The draconians um, are hybrid race of a local reptile species and the Siakar. The Siakar did a panspermia um, along the whole galaxy before the empire ever existed, before the, uh, the galactic authority was ever an idea, before a lot of those races even existed that run the galactic authority there were races um, a lot older. And the Siakar is one of those races. Uh, they're one of the few races in this galaxy that evolved naturally and not through hybridization. Um, and they, so they seeded a lot of um, the planets, a lot of the uh, peoples that later became the peoples that the Draconians took over. The Draconians were the first race among the seeded that the, um, that the uh, Siakar seeded to actually venture out into space. And they conquered wherever they went, just like we do. Only before the, uh, the Galactic Authority existed, so there was nobody to stop them. And believe it or not, the Draconians are more efficient about it than we are. They didn't just blow up wherever and 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 destroy whole planets and species and and strip mine every single thing they saw like we do. They did it more efficiently. They considered themselves as landlords. We now own you, pay us rent. Instead of, well, that's why I hate we're me. going to destroy everything you know and leave you with nothing. And maybe we'll also take you as a resource too. That's the way we operate. That's the way the ICC operates out there. Yeah, um, it's uh, unfortunate that the, it's so much, uh, fuckery going on out there yeah that's why it's kept secret no one wants to accept this stuff's happening and there's another factor into why it's kept secret they they don't want to be taken responsible for their actions against morality yeah the things that they've done to us are pretty bad yeah i didn't sign up for this shit did you nope Man, 
It's a, it's a crime. I have often asked myself, what would my life be like? What would my thoughts be like? What would my desires and aspirations be like if none of that had ever happened to me? If none of that was ever in my subconscious? Yeah, I understand what you mean because it eats away at you. Um, so back to the uh, draconians, you asked, you know, what they're all, the empire is all about. So they, uh, the first race they sought out and uh, found and conquered is the race they refer to as the uh, the draconian the draconian warrior race. I don't know their actual name, but they are the warrior caste. They are the generals and uh, soldiers that are sent out for battle, and they evolved from a turtle-like species. And they're also, you know, hybridized by the Siakar through, you know, the panspermia thing. Um, it, it's hard to find a reptilian race that was not hybridized by either originally the Siakar or um, secondary hybridized by a race that was hybridized by the Zia car. Um, in this galaxy, or I should say this local, uh, this local cluster of galaxies, um, you'd be, you'd be extremely lucky. You should go out and immediately get a Powerball ticket if you can find a race that was originally evolved naturally. Yeah, it's pretty hard to find. They're hard to find these days. But the Sia car is one of them. The Sia car is one of them, though? The Sia car is one of them. The Shahami are not? The Shahami evolved from the Lyrans. The Lyrans hybridized um, out into space also, just like the Sia car. And the Lyrans look like Lyrans, cats. They don't, they? They're not an originally evolved species. They are also hybridized by someone else, which I am not aware of who. The Lyrans the are hybridized? The Lyrans are hybridized too. The Lyrans went to war with the Draconian Empire. The Draconian Empire tried to take them over to, back in the day, several billion years ago, this was um, while the Draconian Empire was at its peak of conquest, conquesting out into space. These days, the, the empire is very stable. They don't conquest at all. In fact, there is no species that currently is undergoing conquest. There are wars that are based on, um, you know, different factors of dislike but there's no actual conquest going on in our galaxy currently. Um, it's been millions and millions of years since um, the last one that I, that I know of. Are you but, aware of how many colonies are in the solar system? In this, in our solar system? This is the solar system. Of just humans or of all different races? Let's start with humans and then let's move on to all the different races. Humans alone, there are probably several hundred colonies, probably close to a thousand colonies. Just, but we're also considering um, military outposts and research facilities and mining um, organizations as also colonies. Anywhere where you have humans living for longer than, you know, a few years, um, even if they're sent back to Earth, age regressed and time traveled back to the moment they were a kid and mind wiped um, when they were first taken, they uh, every everything under those circumstances could be considered a colony, um, and there are several hundred just in our solar system alone. But they're they're not as big as the German colonies that that have reached out into the out throughout this belt where they've taken over whole planets 
and uh, grown entire civilizations. So when you talk about these colonies, um, how many of them are on Mars? And then where are all the other ones? I don't have exact numbers. Uh, don't remember enough for that. And I probably wasn't privy to those numbers to begin with. Um, but the majority of all colonies, regardless of species, is going to be around the green rings of Mars. Most people are not aware of the green rings. There is actual vegetation, plant life, trees on Mars. And it's not as much as it is here on Earth, but there are these, these perfect zones close to the... Uh, the two um, ice caps, both north and south, and it's just a ring. Um, and in the northern hemisphere and in the south southern hemisphere, um, where all the different species uh, reside around that vegetation. Around the equator is where the heaviest storms, um, the electrostatic um, uh, thunderstorms just constantly rage around the equator. And that's actually a byproduct from the original explosion that um, blew away the atmosphere of Mars. And today, Mars' atmosphere is at the point where it is actually breathable by humans. If you're used to breathing at 22,000 feet above sea level on Earth, that's about the uh, the atmospheric um, breathability of Mars. Um, it's enough to stand there, maybe lightly walk for a few minutes, but if you're gonna do anything strenuous, you need a face mask uh, with a uh, source of oxygen. Um, and most of the bases that, the colonies that we have are underground or as far as I understand. If I'm not mistaken, almost all of them are underground. Um, I know that there's uh, entrances that can be seen maybe from the oh, top, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, most entrances are shielded by an electromagnetic force field um, technology these days. Um, and then, you know, also guarded. You know, there are... Mars is more hostile than Earth. Yeah. If you were <laughs> left out, if you, if you found yourself out by yourself, I'm certain you wouldn't survive the day. That's how hostile Mars is. And I'm not referring to the, the weather. Like the, uh, I'm well, referring like... to the native life. Yeah. Like the there spider are people. spiders as much as 10 to uh, 12 feet in length, just their body alone. They'll grow that big. Spiders, I've motherfucking spiders. I've been, I, I, trust me, I know. There are birds that burrow under, everything burrows under the ground. Everything has, has evolved since the destruction of Mars by, I think it was the Jahami, um, has evolved and adapted to burrow under the ground, even the birds. That's wild. Yeah. What was Mars like before they blew up the atmosphere? Uh, very close to Earth. It was an Earth-like, smaller, less gravity, larger things, larger trees and animals. Um, at least that's what the historical records we found says. Um, Mars, Ceres, and our own moon, all three of them used to be the moon's satellite of a another planet that is currently the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. What planet was that? We don't know. I don't have a name. They might have been given a name, but I don't remember it. Um, 
I know the Jahami used to live there. I don't know if that was their home planet, but I know that they did exist there. There were very large dinosaurs there, just like um, on Earth. And I highly suspect that the asteroids that destroyed um, Earth back a long time ago were in fact parts of that planet blasting away. The uh, one whole half of our moon is completely riddled with craters. It's just, there's nowhere there where there is not craters inside of craters, inside of craters, inside of craters on the far side of the moon. Then you've also got Mars, where Mars um, shows signs of a artificially produced radiation that is only produced under a specific kind of nuclear warhead that does not occur naturally. And there's so much of it that it was clear that one blast of this is what blew away the Mars atmosphere. And it, it seems to have been an air burst just, to, just above the, uh, the planet's surface. And they know exactly the point where it occurred because there is a clear forensic signs of a blast having occurred in a specific point on Mars above the surface, above the ground, having um, literally blown everything, all plant life, all building, if any artificial structures would have ceased to exist, a shock wave that rang around the entire planet pushed everything to the exact opposite point of the planet from where that initial blast zone was. And then the shock wave continued. I'm talking about an air shock wave, like from a nuclear blast, that air shock wave that comes out. This shock wave was so powerful, it rang around the planet several times. And there is a debris field of the civilization that existed all around Mars all piled up in one pile at the exact opposite point on the other side of the planet from where this blast happened. Wow, dude. And then you have Ceres, which has a giant crater that makes it look like the Death Star. <laughs> huh, I've never looked at that before. Yeah. Most people aren't aware that there is a planetoid which is smaller, larger than our moon, but smaller than Mars in between the asteroid belt, just out, you know, how the asteroid belt is in between um, Mars and Jupiter. Well, Ceres is in between the asteroid belt and Jupiter. And uh, there's a colony there as well, right? Yeah. And the factors involving our own moon indicate that there is an artificial gravity uh, field generator at its core. At our moon's core? That is holding it there. Our planet is not large enough to capture a body of that size. The moon should never have been captured by Earth. Earth gravity does not have the strength to capture it at all no matter how close it would have been. That's interesting. No matter how, especially at its current rate of speed, it should be moving away a lot faster than it is. And yeah. there is no way that we know of in existence of a body maintaining its rate of spin at the exact same rate of its orbit around its stellar body, like the moon does around the Earth. How the same face shows at all times. It's not because it's not spinning, it's because its spin is in precise sync with its orbit around the Earth. And that doesn't exist in nature. Yeah, that is a bit bizarre. Um, 
I know a little bit about the moon. Uh, from what I understand, it's like sort of Ellis Island of Earth, where if you're leaving, you have to check in there. And if you're coming mm. in, you got to check in there. Um, and another so thing I discovered about Mars, and this was actually a NASA scientist who lost his job by publicizing this on the news years ago, and then it suddenly disappeared. Um, you might still be able to find it on YouTube somewhere. But uh, he talked about how this radiation, they were able to pinpoint the radiation on Mars that was produced by this massive blast. They were able to pinpoint uh, the exact moment within a year of when it occurred. And it was 500,000 years ago. Interesting. Um, so that means that this crazy event that occurred was 500,000 years ago. I suspect the theories that the dinosaurs died out 64 or 65 million years ago is actually incorrect. Um, lab um, experiments have occurred where vegetation have vegetation and uh, living um, or animals that have died. So now their carcasses, uh, in, you know, recently died carcasses were turned into natural gas and crude oil within two weeks time under the amount of pressures and temperatures that exist under the earth where we're, where we're, um, where we're drilling them out of. It only takes a few weeks for that to occur. Hmm. So, so the fact that it took millions of years for, for vegetation and life to, to become na our, the natural gas and the crude oil that runs our society is false. A few weeks. You can literally take, I could take your body after you die and turn it into 100% pure crude oil and natural gas, and it will, um, the next stage is hard coal. Um, crude, oil, um, natural gas, crude oil, and coal within two to three weeks under the right temperature and pressure. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know that much about that kind of stuff, so I can't really comment on anything. But, um, I randomly study all kinds of different things. I have forgotten even more than I remember now. Um, is there anything you want to cover uh, before we get going here? We got about 10 to 20 minutes left. Um, I'm just going with the flow, whatever you want. Um, I guess uh, I'm just very interested in the history of uh, the royal bloodlines, uh, the Knights of Templar, uh, the Jesuits, all these things. It's all connected. Well, there are um, a lot of people out there that know a lot more than I do. Yeah, and, for sure. And and, being um, one of them, yeah, uh, um, I just... Uh, I guess I guess say yeah, like I I don't really have that much more to ask. I feel like we covered a lot, um, but that's what I want to. I can only I talk about what I remember. Yeah, right. Um, but one thing I want to learn a bit more about is, for me, our history has been stolen from us, and I can't help but realize that colonization, colonialism, you know, the Roman Empire, the Crusades. Uh, it all has a lot to do with it, and I want to dive into that a lot more. I know all um, the Crusades were an attempt to literally kill off the bloodline of Joshua, who we call Jesus. Really? It was the, it was the Roman Empire's attempt. It was basically the bloodline's attempt to kill him off. Now you got to ask the question, why? Why was the bloodline? Now, the bloodline at the time was under complete rule and control of Marduk. So, and I believe that it was actually Marduk. 
the whole story about how Jesus went out into the desert for 40 days and then Marty or, or Satan came to him and, um, you know, offered him the whole planet if he would bow down to him. I think that was Marduk because everything lines up um, logically with that having been Marduk. Elaborate on that, why? Uh, because Marduk being the uh, ruler of the planet, um, there's a passage where um, people asked Jesus, you know, what is Satan? And Jesus straight up said, and, and for, for getting all the modern day translations, the original Jewish, um, he called Satan, um, not Satan, but Lucifer, because the word Satan is actually um, Jewish for adversary. So if you and I were at odds, even if we were on different, um, different teams um, battling out in like soccer or football, you know, to me, you're Satan, you're the adversary. Okay. So it's not always a bad thing. It could be just um, adversaries, um, you know. So Lucifer would be a more correct name. Well, there are different names and different people involved and the modern day um, Catholic origin religion lobbed them all into as one person. So now it's like, you got to figure out who was who. And they, they asked who, um, I forget the name they sued, they said, but I think it was um, something akin to Lucifer. But they referred to him, he referred to him as the God of this world, not the king of this world, not the ruler of the underworld, not the slave of God. He said, he said he's the God of this world. Not the all-time creator of all that is. Not the evil demon that haunts your dreams at night. He said he is the God of this world and makes the decisions for this planet, basically. So yeah, that would be Marduk. So Marduk. Interesting. He seems to really be coming up a lot in this, and it's not something that I expected off the bat. <laughs> like, with Penny and you. Like, when I asked her who on the planet, I mean, I should have seen it coming. Like, I shouldn't have been so surprised, but I was really surprised when she said Marduk. I thought that was crazy, and uh, I believe well, it. Anytime you do a historical study on the bloodline families, on Homo Capensis, you come up with you come up against the stories of Marduk. Marduk wasn't the first Homo Capensis, but he was considered the son of Inki. He and considered Inki's heir, blood heir. So Inki, if Inki's the one, if Inki's the Jahami who is in control of paying the rent to the Draconians on Earth then as far as we're concerned, he is the ultimate owner of Earth's lease from the Draconian Empire. And the one who's actually um, orchestrating and organizing and managing all of that is Marduk. Well, um, I think we covered quite a bit with this uh, interview. Um, I feel like we could probably wrap it up here um i don't know what else more we can say uh you know it's interesting you talking about the history of uh the bible and how it connects with the sky god religions and oh it, it gets even that. deeper i'll have to interview you about that next time i think we might have to focus on that topic entirely yeah maybe so we'll uh we'll turn some heads and piss off some people I mean, hey, man, it is what it is. I, I already am beginning to understand that, uh, you know, like the archangels from the Bible are just the Shami and uh, stuff like that. And uh, it's something that I definitely want to delve into. It, that's what this is all about, really, yeah. is, is touching on that subject. So I'll have you on again, definitely. I'm definitely going to try to get a, some other people on here first before I do that, of course. But uh, I'll talk to you again soon. And thanks for coming on the show. And also... 
Thanks to everybody for uh, watching. I'm going to stop recording this now, uh, but I'll, I'll stay on and chat with you for a second.